What's happening, everybody? Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, fueled, as always, by the great folks at Nerd Tees, and welcome to week seven, lucky number seven, of my weekly NFL football pick show for the 2018-2019 NFL regular season and postseason, and we are coming off of what was, arguably, our best week of the season. First of all, straight up, 11-4 and four last week. Second time this season that we've gone 11-4. and four. In fact, I believe second time in the last three weeks that we've gone 11-4. and four. So we're definitely on the right track here with the straight up picks. Now 55-36 and 36 on the season with the two ties. Against the spread, 9-6 and six for the second consecutive week. We go 9-6. and six. Now just five games under 500 against the spread at 43 and 48 with a pair of pushes and over under dun da 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 finally our first time this season above 500 on the over unders it was only 8 and 7 we had to fight to get there but we got there 8 and 7 on the over under has us 41 and 52 and I almost want to throw up when I say that number only 41 and 52 but hey we were over 500 maybe just maybe it's moving in the right direction Platinum, gold, silver, and bronze picks from week six. We swept the games straight up. Bronze pick, the Jets beat the Colts 42-34. to Silver pick, the Texans beat the Bills by a touchdown 20-13. to Gold pick, the Vikings beat the Cardinals by 10 points, 27-17. to And the platinum pick last night, my Green Bay Packers. Holy hell, did they make me sweat it out. But the Packers come from behind, win that game 33-30. to So we were 4-0 straight up on the platinum gold silver and bronze picks against the spread we were three and one i told you to take the jets minus two and a half the bills plus eight and a half works out because they only lose by seven the cardinals by the slimmest of margins i told you to go plus ten and a half they lose the game by exactly ten the only one that didn't cover were the packers last night i told you to take a minus the nine and a half points they only win the game by a field goal and on the over-under, went 3-1 and one as well. So again, an incredible week in those picks specifically. In the Jets-Colts, I told you to go over 45. They get to what? That's 76. Uh, under 40.5 in Houston and Buffalo, they only get to 33. The one that I lost was under 43 points in Minnesota, Arizona. They get to 44. So I guess that's the give back for getting it right by only a half point against the spread. And last night, I told you to go over 46 and a half points. The two teams had 44 points by halftime. So it sailed over with 63. So 4-0 straight up, 3-1 against the spread, and 3-1 on the over-unders just in the platinum, gold, silver, and bronze picks. Oh, we're feeling good. Taking a look now at the Bridgewater's Finest and official NFL YouTube prognosticators pick'em pools. In the Bridgewater's Finest pool, I've moved up now inside the top 12. I'm in 12th place out of the 43 people making picks in the league. 480 out of 768 possible confidence points. That's a clip of 63% and it is a far cry better than where we were just a few weeks ago. We were down in, you know, the mid to high 50s. You go back three weeks, it was not looking good. We were at about 50 50%. So we're definitely, definitely shooting up the rankings there. 98 out of 120 possible confidence points in week six. That's an 82% clip. And it was just off of the winner for the week. Shout out to our week six winner, more than a Thielen, who led the pool for large portions of last season, I believe it was. More than a Thielen went 11 and four last week, just like I did. Managed the confidence points, just that marginal fraction a little bit better. 100 out of 120 possible confidence points for more than a Thielen. That's a clip of 83%, good enough to win the week. Billy B, fellow NFL YouTube prognosticator, fellow admin of the NFL YouTube prognosticator's Facebook page, he is now our overall leader in the pick'em pool, 56 and 35 with the two ties for Billy B, so just one better than I am, 522 out of 768 possible confidence points. That's a clip of 68%. It's a couple of percentage points under our typical championship pace, but Billy B setting the pace for us this season. 
in the official NFL YouTube prognosticators pick em pool, which isn't against the spread pool. I've moved down from a tie to seventh into a tie for ninth out of the 51 people in the pool making picks with 41 correct against the spread picks based on Yahoo's lines out of the 93 games. So that's only 44%, but we did do better than 50% according to Yahoo last week, got eight of the 15 games correct for a percentile clip of 53%. Shout out to our week six winner, Gavin OC4, Gavin O'Connor, fellow NFL YouTube prog, very involved in the community. 10 out of the 15 games he got correct against the spread last week, couple better than mine according to Yahoo's lines. That's a clip of 67%. That's a great week for you, Gavin. J3 remains the overall leader. He's got a 10 game cushion on me, and I think he's got at least, you know, three or four games, probably more than that cushion on the person in second place. So J3's got a nice comfortable lead here, 51 of the 93 games picked correctly against the spread. That's a clip of 55%. That's what we're shooting for first before we push towards the magic number of 60. So shout out to more than a Thielen and Gavin OC4 for winning week six and Billy B and J3 for remaining the overall leaders. Let's take a peek into Fantasy Corner and see how my eight fantasy football teams did in week six action. And I would argue probably my best week of fantasy as well so we are just on fire went six and two across my eight teams in fantasy football last week in the professionals dynasty fantasy football league i pulled out the monday night miracle and i it's the monday night miracle that i feel the worst about so i was up against holly gordon mayfield of dreams one of the best names in the league too somehow managed to do it by about a uh, little more than a tenth of a point and I felt I kind of felt bad about it because I was like okay no this is over this is done and then like the last two minutes of the fourth quarter happened I was almost hoping for a stat correction overnight and I said this right to Holly in the group chat I was like I, I hope there's a stat correction because I don't deserve to win you absolutely deserve to win this week there wasn't, so I took the win there. I'm now 4-2 and two in that league. I've won four consecutive games. I got a Week 7 matchup coming up against Jamie Brunt. He's currently in last place in the league, but I got a number of players on by. So if there's any week that he could step to me and beat me, it's going to be this week. Right now, I'm still projected to win, but that's not a layup by any means. In the official NFL YouTube Prognosticators Fantasy Football League, I picked up the win last week over Geo Knows Fantasy. He knows fantasy except when Alvin Kamara's on a bye. So I'm at 5-1. and one. I'm very close to the top of that league, if not at the top of the league. I got a Week 7 matchup against Jackalopes, who I believe has either won this league before or has been you know, very, very competitive in it before. Right now it's a projected win for me, but it's by a very slim margin. So I got a lot of work to do, obviously, this week in fantasy football. So Mayfield of Dreams and Geo Knows Fantasy, thank you for the matchups in Week 6. And in Week 7... Jamie Brunt and Jackalopes, let's do this. And as always, I'll take this opportunity to remind you that if you go to the description of the video on YouTube or the description on iTunes or SoundCloud, you are going to find all of my results from week six, all of my straight up against the spread and over under plays for week seven in the NFL. You're going to find information on joining the Bridgewater's Finest and official NFL YouTube prognosticators pick em pools. You are going to find information on joining the NFL YouTube prognosticators Facebook page where we talk football all week long. Great community, tons of people in there. Let's get mo even more discussion going about the NFL. Join the Facebook page and you're going to find information on my lovely tea sponsors, Nerd Teas. NerdTees.ca, use that promo code BWFINEST, going to save you 15% at checkout. Free shipping on any order in Canada over 50 bucks. If you're in the U.S., two little clicks of a button, everything becomes U.S. prices. You get an excellent conversion right there. Today's blend is Kiwi-licious. I can't remember whether I talked about that on this show or it might have been on the CFL show. It's a nice citrusy Kiwi blend. It's delicious, got a really good flavor to it. One of the smoothest black teas I think I've ever drank. Nerdteas.ca, use that promo code BWFINEST. Find yourself something to love or find someone you love something to love. You can do it on nerdteas.ca.
14 games in the NFL this week as more and more teams start hitting their early season bye. I guess we're getting close to a mid-season bye at this point. Gee, six weeks already gone in the NFL season. What I actually felt about this week's slate of games just in general, I feel like this was the hardest week to cap because I looked at some games and I'm like, the numbers are telling me this thing, but I don't think the numbers are matching the reality of this thing. So I honestly found this week to probably be the hardest week this season so let's see how we do let's start with thursday night football so we're going to go to arizona where the cardinals are going to play host to the denver broncos in a game that i guess you could quote geo and say may be canceled due to lack of interest broncos here are two and four losers of four consecutive games after opening with two straight wins at home you look at the arizona cardinals no longer alone in the basement of the nfc west they're now joined by the san francisco 49ers but i mean the cardinals they've been getting outscored by about 10 points a game so not exactly a a highly sought after matchup the Cardinals, while not being the worst scoring offense in the NFL, are currently the worst total offense in the NFL, averaging just 220.5 yards per game. Denver sitting comfortably inside the top 12, about 388 yards a game, and, uh, you know, getting obviously the majority through the air, but running the ball incredibly well, over 120 yards per game on the ground that has them inside the top 10 in the NFL. That probably spells very bad news for a Cardinals team that is just giving up buckets and buckets and buckets of yards on the ground. But it is worth saying, as bad as their run defense is, one of the only teams in the NFL, in fact the only team that has a worse run defense statistically than the Cardinals, are the Broncos. Cards giving up over 150 yards a game on the ground, Denver giving up over 160 the secondaries are fairly comparable. The scoring defenses, Arizona's actually got a better scoring defense than the Denver Broncos do. What has really let the Cardinals down, obviously, is the offensive side of the football. In saying that, the Cards have scored at least 17 points in their last three straight games. They put up 28 on San Francisco in a win in San Francisco two weeks ago. So maybe the offense is turning around a little bit. And I gotta tell you, I look at this Broncos team and I realize this is a team that does not travel very well they don't have to travel a huge distance here just going from you know Colorado to Arizona but still anytime they're not in their own building you really got to hesitate to take the Broncos I think this is very much a coin flip of a football game, but when I look at Arizona and I look at Denver, I say, okay, which team is more likely, if the defenses are relatively comparable, which team is more likely to be able to move the football? And I honestly just don't think Arizona is going to find any answer to Denver's run game. I'm going to take the Broncos here, even though the game is in Arizona. Let's take Denver on the road in Arizona to beat the Cardinals. I would certainly be much more afraid of the Cardinals if I were the Broncos, if the Cardinals had any idea how to run the football right now, but luckily they don't. On the line, Broncos are actually two and a half point favorites on the road here in Arizona. Again, I flip-flopped back and forth on this game, so at one point I had Arizona plus two and a half, at one point I had Arizona winning outright, so I really flip-flopped on this game, but ultimately Denver's got too many weapons here so I like the Broncos to win it's a small price to pay so we're gonna go Denver minus the two and a half points total in the game is 41 I've got it capped a little bit higher than this but the two teams are combined four and eight over under this season so I'm gonna skew on a lot of running a lot of clock being bled off so we're actually gonna stick under on this game and go under 41 points Let's go to Chicago now. Bears playing host to the New England Patriots. New England got it done against Kansas City this past week in what might have been one of the games, if not the game of the NFL season so far this season. Chicago, on the other hand, did not get the job done last week. They lost by three points to Miami in overtime, a game that I thought they would run all over the Dolphins. Didn't work. Gave up the 31 points. Not exactly a virtuoso defensive performance. Obviously worth pointing out here that the Bears' defense is much better than what they showed last week. That said, they got thrown all over by Brock Osweiler. 
I'm seeing a ton of people take Chicago here. And honestly, when you crunch the full season numbers, I totally see why people are taking Chicago. I could see a scenario where you could cap Chicago as being like a two to three to even four point favorite in this game, especially where they're playing at home. But Chicago's coming off of a bad defensive performance. And had they gone in there and just dominated Miami on the defensive side, given up, you know, single digits or low double digit points. If they had done that, I would probably be on the bandwagon with you, but they didn't. They got torched kind of for 31 points against an offense that is not nearly as good as the one they're going to have to play this week. Even though the game's in their own building, you can't not take the Patriots here. At least I can't not take the Patriots because it definitely looks like they've turned that corner. They proved a ton to me this past week. They're going to go into Chicago, as far as I'm concerned, and beat the Bears. So let's take the Patriots on the road in Chicago to beat the Bears. I'm running with those road warriors yet again. On the line, the Patriots are favored by three and a half points on the road, make Chicago three and a half point dog at home. Another one that even with thinking that New England was going to win the game, I considered hedging because I'm like, man, I mean, Chicago's defense is really good. But if Chicago has a weakness on their defensive side, it is in the secondary. You can throw on the Bears. Tough to run on them, but you can throw on them. I think Brady's going to be able to do that. He's got so many weapons that are playing so well right now. They're relatively healthy. In fact, I think they might even be pretty well perfectly healthy. So it's... It's too small of a margin for me to hedge. If this was like five points or five and a half or six or something ridiculous like that, I would probably hedge it. But it's too small of a margin for me. 70% of the public here are also on the Patriots minus the three and a half. So I'm going to go with that as well. Let's take the Patriots minus the three and a half points. Total in the game is 49 and a half. It's pretty well a perfect total. I capped this thing at 50, but 100% of the experts on covers are taking the under in this football game. And I can actually see where that could go because again, Mitch Trubisky is far from proven as far as I'm concerned. Chicago can put up points. New England obviously can put up points, but I think this thing stays under. It's going to be tight one way or the other. This would be a prime number to tease one way or the other, but... I would say take the under in this one. Let's go under 49 and a half points in Chicago, New England. Let's go to Indianapolis now where the Colts are going to play host to the Buffalo Bills. The Bills coming into this game back-to-back road games. Colts coming into this game losers of four consecutive games. Now one and five in the bottom of the AFC South. Bills lost that game last week on what I believe was a pick six, if I remember correctly. So, I mean, they were definitely in position to put themselves in a position to win that football game because Houston, I I just don't know what's going on with the Houston Texans. I was so high on them at the beginning of the season. Buffalo had a chance to win that game last week, but they didn't. And as much as it's easy to say, yeah, well, they deserve to win, yeah, but they didn't. Finishing, finishing what you started plays an important role when you're trying to pick football games is this a team that is capable on a consistent basis of finishing and if they're not it's hard to go with them i would say that andrew luck and the colts offense is having a successful return to the nfl this season luck and the colts putting up 286 yards of pass offense per game scoring just over 25 points a game both of those margins are far ahead of the buffalo bills who are the worst pass offense in the NFL, they're also the worst scoring offense. On the defensive side, kind of the same old story though for the Colts. 280 yards a game given up through the air, over a buck five on the ground. They're giving up 30 points a game. That's pretty ugly. And the one thing that has really gone right for Buffalo this season is the at least the total defense. They're the number three total defense in the NFL right now. I don't hear anybody talking about that. Only giving up Uh, just a little bit over 215 yards a game through the air, less than 100 yards a game on the ground. They can stop the run. They can stop the pass. They are giving up 23 points a game, so there are points to be scored on the Bills, but a lot of that also has to do with the ineptitude of their offense. 
this could have been a position where I could have looked at taking the Bills straight up, but man, back-to-back road games for the Bills and not a team that tra- obviously travels very well. If this was a good football team, like if this struck me as a good football team, I might consider taking them in this spot. But again, the back-to-back road games, it really hurts. And I got to give you a little bit of context here, I feel, because I talk about back-to-back road games like it's this big, ominous thing. I've gone back so far this season teams that are playing the second of their back-to-back road games or even the third of their back-to-back-to-back road games, teams playing back-to-back road games are combined 7-13 and 13 straight up this season. So only winning one out of every three games. They have combined to have zero winning weeks so far through six weeks in the NFL. So no single week has more teams playing back-to-back road games won their game than lost them. Against the spread, they're a little bit better. They're 9-11 and 11 against the spread, and they've even had a winning week back in week four. That's just a little bit of context to let you know when I talk about back-to-back road games, I'm not just blowing smoke. The numbers support it. I think the Colts have more upside on offense. I'm going to take the Colts to win, especially where it's in their own building. Let's take Indianapolis at home to beat Buffalo. Against the spread, Indy is favored by upwards of a full touchdown. I got it at minus the six and a half favored for the Colts, but I'm not going to take that. That's too many points for me. Buffalo could conceivably win this game. Indianapolis is by no means a juggernaut. Six and a half points, way too many for me with two comparable football teams, especially where the one is a very, very good defensive unit. So let's take Buffalo plus the six and a half. Total in the game is 42 and a half points. That is a very low total. I've got this game capped much higher than that. So we're going to go over on this. Go over 42 and a half points in Indianapolis Buffalo. We'll go to Miami now where the Dolphins, again, coming off of that overtime victory last week. They play the Detroit Lions. The Lions coming into this game off of their bye. Look, we can't understate this. Miami beat a very good football team last week in the Chicago Bears. And a Bears team that... In, you know, historically at least, plays rather well on the road. So look, Miami went in, they won that football game. That's a huge boost to them, especially with a backup quarterback in Brock Osweiler, who played incredibly well, put up the points, led that game-winning drive, won them that game. Miami is unbeaten in their own building this season. They're 3-0 and at home. Now, people could make the argument, yeah, but, you know, their first two wins were against nobodies. It was against Tennessee, and they don't travel well. And it was against Oakland, and they don't travel well. Well, what do you say now? They just beat the Bears, who people were talking about as being like, this could be the best defense in the NFL. And Miami just hung 31 points on them. And Frank Gore turns back the hands of time and goes for 101 yards on one of the best run defenses in the NFL. I'll tell you what, they ain't playing one of the best run defenses in the NFL this week. As a matter of fact, they're playing the third worst. Detroit giving up over 145 yards per game on the ground, 27 points a game on the defensive side allowed, and Detroit has not won a game away from home this season. So you're talking about unbeaten at home versus winless on the road. Maybe it's a trap scenario, but I really like the Dolphins here, and I've been against the Dolphins most of the season. I may not have picked with them, once this year but I am picking with them in this spot even though Detroit's coming in off the bye they should be relatively healthy I've got to see more from Detroit especially away from home I got to see them commit to carry on Johnson I've got to see Matt Stafford play like Matt Stafford I got to see a lot more from Detroit before I would take them in this spot so I'm going to take Miami at home to beat the Lions on the line somehow inexplicably the Dolphins are a one-point dog at home. Now it's only a very small number of books that have actually opened to this game because they're like, well, who's going to be the quarterback? Is it going to be Tannehill? Is it going to be Osweiler? But a couple of books have opened this thing and they've opened it at Miami at a one point dog. So uh, thank you. I appreciate that very much. So we're going to take Miami plus one because I like him to win the game. And because Vegas are cowards, there is no total in this game yet. And I suppose I should even maybe clarify that. When I say Vegas are cowards, I'm not even really holding it against them. They're just cowards. So if I'm gonna if they're gonna be a coward, I'm gonna call them out on it and call them out as being cowards. That's all that it is. It's no hate. I understand. Of course they're cowards. It's their money on the line. But you know, yeah, they're cowards. No total in this game. I've got it capped at a low 50. 
So if you get any number in this game that begins with a four, grab the over on it because I feel really good about this game getting up into the 50s. Let's go to New York now where the Jets are going to play host to the Minnesota Vikings and you got to start maybe asking the question, who is this Vikings team really? Granted, the Vikings have won two games in a row, has them above 500 at 3, 2, and 1 in that jam-packed NFC North where everybody has at least two wins, three teams have three wins. Like, that division is anybody's game right now. But if you look at the Vikings, man, they might be 3, 2, and 1, but they're getting outscored this season. They've got the worst scoring defense in that division. That is a division that includes Detroit and Green Bay. And yes, they have won two games in a row. They went into Philadelphia and they hung a loss on the defending Super Bowl champions. That's a huge win. They beat Arizona last week by 10 points. They didn't cover the spread and it's Arizona in their own building. Now they got to travel to New York and the Jets are a team that's putting up points. Again, we talk about how big of a role it plays in picking these games that you are finishers, that you are finishers, that you get the job done, that you put points on the board, don't settle for field goals, score touchdowns. The Jets are averaging 27.5 points a game this season. They're moving the ball fairly well, especially on the ground, 130 yards a game for the Jets on the ground. Now look, the Vikings, they're getting the job done on the defensive side. They're giving up a few more points a game than I would have expected. But look, they're giving up less than 95 yards a game on the ground. The secondary's only been okay, which is a little bit of a disappointment given that it's the Vikings and last year that was one of their great strengths. Do I think the Jets are capable of winning this football game? Absolutely. Do the numbers, if you crunch the whole season numbers, does it support that the Jets can win the game? Absolutely. Do I think the Jets are going to win the game? No. I've got to give the benefit of the doubt to a team that when I did my preseason rankings, I gave them a ceiling of 16-0. and They were the only team in football that I gave that ceiling to. I've got to give them the benefit of the doubt that whatever's been going on at the early part of the season, maybe they've shooken. They've got two straight wins. They win in, they beat the Super Bowl champs in their own building. Now they're going to go in and play a team that is not nearly as dangerous as that team. So that, of course, leads to the propensity of, well, are they going to play down to their opponent or quote-unquote play down or think they're playing down to an opponent that's actually better than they think they are? So all of these questions are legit. And that's what makes this job so hard. The Jets have lost a game at home this season. The Vikings have won a game on the road this season. The Vikings, to me, are the better football team. They should hopefully get Dalvin Cook back this week, although it's not like they've been super, super missing him with how Latavius Murray has played the last little bit. But they should get Dalvin Cook back. That does make the offense more dangerous. I think I got to lean on the Vikings this week, with the caveat being I could totally see a scenario where the Jets win this game. We're going to go with the Vikings despite the spot on the road in New York to beat the Jets. On the line, Jets are three-point dogs at home, and I really heavily considered hedging my bets here. But once again, that's such a small margin for a hedge, kind of like when I talked about the Patriots and the Bears. Such a small margin for a hedge, unless, of course, the Jets win the game outright. Since I'm not taking them to win the game outright, even though there's the possibility that it exists, it's a small price to pay for the team that I think is going to win. So let's take Minnesota minus the three. I'm with the public and with the experts on that one as well, 75 and 70% respectively. Total in the game is 47 points. I've got this thing capped at 50. So I think I've got to go over on that one. We're going to go over the 47 points in Minnesota, New York. Let's go to Tampa now where the Bucks are going to play host to the Cleveland Browns. Jameis Winston, he's back in there and Jameis Winston looked pretty damn good. Granted, the Bucks lost that game last week. They lost to the Falcons, but they still put up 29 points. Jameis Winston still had himself a decent little game. Winston did throw the two interceptions, which is always going to be a concern with him. His accuracy has always been the thing that I think has held him back. He's got an arm. He threw for 395 yards. He found the end zone four times. It's the accuracy. So look, without those two interceptions, I think the Bucks could very easily have won that game. Browns kind of got embarrassed last week. Uh, that's what, three full possession loss to the Chargers, 38-14. to 14. 
And man, they, yeah, just not, defense didn't look good in that game. Offense didn't look good in that game. I think that game was in Cleveland, unless I'm mistaken. So, ooh, oh boy, maybe the shine has finally fallen off of the Cleveland Browns. I wouldn't say Baker Mayfield had a bad game, but he was under 50% passing. He did throw two picks in that game against the Chargers. Now, look, they're playing, the Browns are, they're playing a much worse defense this week than they played last week. So that's an uptick for all the Brown skill players. Certainly an uptick for Baker Mayfield, who will be playing the worst statistical secondary in the NFL this season. The Bucks giving up over 300 and well over, in fact, 350 yards per game passing. Now, Cleveland's secondary is also below par this season. They're just number 20, 268 yards per game through the air allowed. They're really giving up a ton on the ground to 138 yards against. The scoring defenses, they're not close. Tampa Bay's scoring defense has been awful this season. Cleveland's has been honestly not too bad. I think what really tipped the scales for me in looking at this game, though, was I looked back at Cleveland's game on the road in Oakland. A game that I thought Cleveland should have won, probably could have won, and arguably gave away. And all of a sudden it reminded me, oh right, the Browns are still a team that, while they may now know what it takes to win a game, don't necessarily know what it takes to win a game on the road. The Browns have not won away from their own building in a long time. It's a different beast. I think I'm going to take the Bucks here. I like the Bucks' ability to put up points on this defense. This is going to be a high-scoring game, by the way. I like the Bucks' ability to put up points on this defense. I don't necessarily like Cleveland's ability to run the football because the Bucks, the only thing defensively that the Bucks have done right is their ability to stop the run. So I, I kind of like the Bucks here. That's the way we're going to go. Let's take Tampa Bay at home to beat Cleveland. On the line, Bucks are favored by three points, only naturally that magical three-point line, Cleveland three-point dogs on the road. I like the Bucks to win. This is a relatively small price to pay. The public and the experts are on it as well. We're going to go Tampa Bay minus three at home against Cleveland. Total in the game is 49 and a half points, which is ridiculous. Take the over. I've got this capped like 10 points higher than this to over 49 and a half and don't even give it a second thought. Let's go to Jacksonville now. Jags playing host to the Houston Texans. And this is another team. Will the real Jacksonville Jaguars please stand up? I will raise my hand and say this. I called Dallas beating Jacksonville last week. And you can go back and listen to the episode last week and you can hear it. I didn't call Jacksonville losing by 33 points. I realized they were on back-to-back -back road games. And holy crap, You got at this point you got to kind of hit yourself and go, Oh right. Jacksonville, just like Cleveland, is a team that still probably has no idea how to win, certainly not win consistently on the road. And that's going to be the one thing I think that's going to hold the Jags back from being true Super Bowl contenders. You got to know how to win at least half the time away from your own building. Now, lucky, lucky them, they get to come home and they are playing in their own building, but they're playing the hottest team in the division. They're playing the Houston Texans. They've won three straight games. They've won a game on the road this season. They've won a division game this season. This is not an easy out for the Jags. And I don't really know what it is, if I'm being perfectly honest. Is it a regression in the defense? Is it a regression in Blake Bortles? Is it the fact that they don't have Leonard Fournette consistently? Is it a combination of all of these things? Maybe the defense wasn't quite as good as we all thought it was. Certainly, I think it's become evident that Blake Bortles, not quite as good as some people thought he was, or not taking the step forward that some people thought he was. Maybe it's injuries. It's probably a noxious cocktail of all of these things. The Jags are not layup, you know, just take them and don't think twice about it. They're not on that level. And the Texans, despite winning three straight football games, could very easily have lost three straight football games. It's just, it's these one of the most frustrating teams to try to ride with and try to get behind and get excited about. They're such a frustrating team. Division games, anything can happen. But I think I gotta trust the team that top to bottom I truly feel is the better team. And I think that's the Jacksonville Jaguars.
The numbers certainly on offense don't necessarily support that, but we're still talking about the number two total defense in the NFL. The scoring defense is really what needs to kind of be shored up. And part of that is Jacksonville's giving up a ton of yardage on the ground. So Houston may very well be able to find some holes in that run game, drain the clock, and might put them in a pretty decent position to pull an upset here. And again, division games, anything can happen. But we're going to take Jacksonville here in a decent spot at home. Let's take the Jags at home to beat the Texans. On the line, Jacksonville favored by five points at home. And to me, that's ridiculous. Full-fledged hedge. I really like that. I I just literally thought of that rhyme. Full-fledged hedge here. We're going to go Houston plus five because the Texans could very easily, again, they've won three straight games, could very easily jump up, steal this football game. We're going to take those points. Houston plus five total in the game is 42 and a half I actually capped this just a little bit higher than that but the two teams are five and seven over under I expect a lot of running in this game it's a division football game I think I'm actually gonna stick under on it I think this could be a classic AFC South matchup low scoring tough defensively let's go under 42 and a half points in Houston Jacksonville Let's go to Baltimore now where the Ravens are going to welcome in the New Orleans Saints. New Orleans coming off of their bye last week. Ravens cruised to a 21-0 victory against the Tennessee Titans last week. I kind of thought Tennessee might step to Baltimore in that game, might up their game, and they get shut out. Some days I just sit here and I'm like, man, I feel bad for Keith Bailey. (laughs) I don't think enough people are talking about Joe Flacco and the Baltimore Ravens. I really, really don't. They're a top 10 total offense. They're throwing the ball incredibly well. Top 10 in that as well. The run offense could be a little bit better. You know, they're kind of, they're actually below, actually well below middle of the pack, under 100 yards a game. But they're scoring 25 and a half points a game. Baltimore is not traditionally an offensive football team, but they're inside the top 12 in scoring. And when you pop over and take a look at the defense the Baltimore Ravens are the number one total defense in football right now giving up under 190 yards a game through the air that's about as good as Jacksonville and they're stopping them on the run too only giving up 13 points against per game here's also an interesting little tidbit there is only one team in the NFL that Drew Brees has never beaten he is 0-4 against the Baltimore Ravens And by the way, I realize when I talk about the Ravens scoring defense that, look, they played the Bills the first week and only gave up three points. They just shut out the Titans. They only gave up 12 points because they were playing against the Cleveland Browns. But look, they played the Steelers. What happened with the Steelers? They only gave up 14 points against the Steelers. Yeah, they gave up 34 against the Bengals, and that's been the vast majority of the points they've given up this season. So it's tough to depend on just that number of, of, you know, 12.7 or whatever it is points per game. I realize that you can't take that alone by itself. But across the board, the Ravens are playing incredible defense. And that obviously is going to be tested against the number one scoring offense in football, the number three total offense in football. They're running the ball better. They're throwing the ball incredibly well. One of the tops in the league. Obviously, Drew Brees is Drew Brees, and there are so many damn weapons on that New Orleans Saints team. I'm just kind of a believer in what Baltimore has done so far. So then why, oh why, am I picking the Saints? I feel having now watched the first six weeks of the season, that the Saints are a team of magic. I think bringing having Mark Ingram now back and the way they're utilizing Ingram and Kamara might make Kamara fantasy owners a little upset, but I mean, look, they're utilizing that in such a way as to win football games. Drew Brees just set that record last week. He's playing the only team in the NFL he's never beaten. Storylines sometimes play a role in these games. Plus, New Orleans coming in off their bye. They're going to be well-rested. I don't know. I just I just like the Saints here. Plus, I mean, I've got to imagine that the Ravens' offense is not as good as the numbers are showing it to be right now. 
the Saints also have not lost a game on the road this year. Like, look, Baltimore, I believe, is unbeaten at home, but I know for a fact the Saints have not lost a game away from their own building this year. And for a team that traditionally does not travel very well, being 2-0 and on the road, including a win against an AFC team, that is huge. So that's the way I'm going with this. Road Warrior once again. I'm going to take the Saints in Baltimore to upset the Ravens. And it is an upset. On the line, Ravens are favored by two and a half points at home. Very slim margin. Saints are two and a half point dogs. Obviously, we're going to take that because we like them to win the game outright. Saints plus two and a half. Total in the game is 49 and a half points. I kind of think it goes over. I don't think New Orleans defense is tremendous. I think Baltimore will be able to score their points. I just think New Orleans is going to score more. So I'm going to say go over the 49 and a half points. I've got this capped at a kind of a low to mid 50. So go over 49 and a half in New Orleans, Baltimore. Let's go to San Francisco now where the 49ers, man, like, look, I'm going to say, I say this as a Packers fan, 49ers should have won that game last night. There's almost no reason why they didn't win the game last night. 49ers should have won. And what do they get on a short week as, as, you know, a thank you for the fact that they should have won that game against Green Bay and lost. Well, they get to go home and play the LA Rams. So Niners on a short week. Rams are the only unbeaten team left in football. Seems like a layup, right? Hang on. Rams are playing back to back to back road games. Their third consecutive game away from home. Now, granted, San Francisco and Los Angeles, you're in the same state. So how much of a road game is it really? But it is still, you know, it's not your own building. So it is the third straight road game. Obviously, all the numbers in this would point to the Rams. Their offense is great. Their defense, yeah, it's not good, but it's kind of getting better. But San Francisco flat out, I think, kind of blew that game last night. And I heard some people on Twitter, because this happens all the time, oh, the refs bailed the Packers out on that uh, on that, uh, on that holding call on Richard Sherman. No. Watch the play. Look at the play. Did he hold him? Yeah. And it got called. Thank you very much. So anyway, look, the 49ers, they, look, they lost the game. They had a chance to win. They arguably should have won. They lost. They gave up a ton of yardage. They gave up a ton of points. And look, the Rams are going to come in. That offense playing incredibly well. Nobody can stop Todd Gurley right now. People, I think, other teams in the NFL are going to have to beg for a Todd Gurley injury in order to kind of try to catch up to the Rams. The only reason this is not in my platinum, gold, silver, and bronze is because it's on the road and because it's the Rams' third straight. I'm going to take the Rams to win the game because I just don't... eh, I think San Fran will be able to score points, but I just don't like the possibility of them winning the game outright. We're going to take the Rams on the road in San Fran to beat the 49ers. On the line, the Niners are 11-point dogs at home. So we are definitely going to take those points. A, it's too many points to begin with. B, it's a division game. C, it's back-to-back-to-back road games for the Rams. All the things that I've said about this game. We're going to take the 49ers plus 11 points because I think this, as a division matchup, could be pretty tight. Total in the game is 53. Pretty damn good total. I capped this right around 54, maybe a 55. The two teams are 8-4 and four on the over-under, which is enough of a lean for me. I do see a lot of points in this one. So let's go over 53 points in LA San Francisco. And the last game we're going to look at before we get into the platinum, gold, silver, and bronze picks for week seven is another division matchup. The Washington Redskins playing host to the Dallas Cowboys. Dallas obviously picking up that huge win last week, that monstrous, that blowout of Jacksonville. And the Redskins, they got the job done, man. They beat a very good Carolina Panthers football team, beat them by six points. These are two teams coming into this game kind of feeling like they might be heading in the right direction. Skins currently lead the division at 3-2 and two because, again, they've only played five games. Dallas and the Eagles have both played six. So you got Washington at the top of the chart right now. Despite being 3-2, and two, they're only outscoring opponents by two points so far on the season. Cowboys are winless on the road this year. All three of their losses have come away from home. All three of their wins have come at home. So this kind of feels, and the numbers would kind of support this too, kind of feels like a good spot for Washington in an important division game. On the defensive side, these two teams are incredibly, incredibly comparable. Dallas and Washington are the number four and number five total defenses so far this season. 
The secondaries, very comparable. Washington's is a little bit worse. The run defense, almost identical. Point scoring, Dallas only giving up 17 points a game. Washington giving up just under 21 because Washington's only played the five games. And while the Cowboys are certainly by no means an offensive juggernaut, neither are Washington right now. These are two teams that are well inside the bottom 10 in terms of total offense. Washington's is obviously markedly better, and that's mostly because of the pass offense. Dallas is running all over teams, 147 yards a game on the ground, and the scoring offense is pretty comparable. I honestly think... The Dallas Cowboys step to Washington, and I think Dallas wins this football game. I think Dallas wins the game with their run offense. I don't see Washington stopping Zeke Elliott. I really, really don't. And Dallas kind of looked like maybe they were getting the pass game going a little bit more against Jacksonville. I mean, Jacksonville just may have just not put up any resistance at all, but it just felt to me like maybe the pass offense is coming around a little bit. The offensive line is playing fairly well. I like Dallas here. This is I, not a great spot for Dallas, obviously, where they haven't won on the road. I think that changes this week. Let's take the Cowboys in Washington to beat the Redskins. On the line, Washington is a point and a half favorite at home. Obviously, we like Dallas to win. So we'll take those points and go Dallas plus the point and a half. Total in the game is 41. I'm capping this one at like a mid 30. So I think you stay under on that one. Low scoring game, tight game. I just like Dallas to come out on top. We're going to go under 41 points in Washington, Dallas. All right, folks, platinum, gold, silver, and bronze picks for week seven are on the way. We're going to start at the bottom, as we always do, with the bronze pick, where I am three and three straight up. Now, three, two, and one against the spread, so over 500 there. Only two and four on the total. And the bronze pick sees the Los Angeles Chargers at home playing host to the Tennessee Titans. And this is a very easy uh, equation for me. You've got the Chargers who are coming off of a blowout win. You've got the Titans who are coming in off of a blowout loss. Chargers have won two of their three games at home. Titans have lost two of their three games on the road. They're only two and three against teams in the AFC. The Chargers are three and one. They've only lost one game against an AFC opponent. Chargers have won three straight games. I'm on LA here. I'm on LA all day. We're going to take the Chargers at home to lay another loss on the Tennessee Titans and their struggling offense. On the line, the Chargers are favored by six and a half points at home. I originally felt like I was going to hedge this one because I was like, man, six and a half, that's a lot of points. It's not like the Chargers are like this wholly reliable football team. So I was like, eh, that's, you know, that's, that's a little tight for me. But if you look at the Titans, two of their three losses on the season have come by at least a touchdown if not more. So like, if I like the Chargers to win the game, which I do, there's a good chance that if Tennessee's going to lose, they're probably going to lose by more than a touchdown. So that would cover this number. 73% of the public are on this as well. So we're going to take that. Let's take the Chargers minus the six and a half points. Total in the game, 45 and a half. I capped this game lower than this, almost by a full field goal. So I was very tempted to take the under. But the Chargers are 5-1 and one over under this season. So again, if I like the Chargers to win, and I like them to cover, and they're 5-1 and one on the over under, means they're scoring a lot of points, let's go ahead and even kind of go against what I think the numbers say. We're going to go over 45.5 points. It's a middling number. We're going to do it. So, Chargers straight up. We're hammering the Chargers minus 6.5 against the spread in a game that goes over 45.5 points. That is your bronze pick. Your silver pick, where I'm a red hot 5 and 1 straight up, 3 and 3 against the spread, only 2 and 4 on the over under, sees the Philadelphia Eagles at home playing host to the Carolina Panthers. This is back to back road games for the Panthers. Philly coming off of the long week, having played the Thursday nighter in week 6. I feel like Carson Wentz is back, baby, because the way that he played in that game, I even tweeted it. I was like, I, I co-opted some Eminem lyrics, like, guess who's back, back again, Wentz is back, tell the rest of the NFL. I definitely felt like that game against Washington last week was a coulda, shoulda, woulda game for the Panthers. I thought they should have won that game. They didn't win that game. Now they definitely got to step up in competition, stay on the road, go into the building of the defending Super Bowl champs with Carson Wentz, who looks like Carson Wentz again. I'm all over Philly in this game. Let's take the Eagles at home on the long week to beat the Panthers. On the line, 
Eagles are favored by four and a half points at home. This is an utter coin flip to me. It's a coin flip to the public. It's a coin flip to the experts. I was really tempted to hedge my bets in this one. And I think one of the free picks on covers, in fact, advises to uh, to hedge the bets on this. But again, it's it's Carson Wentz, man. I think Carson Wentz is capable of covering this number with this Eagles team. So we're going to take the Eagles minus the four and a half points at home against Carolina. Total in the game, once again, 45 and a half points. It's a middling number. It's pretty well perfect to what I have this game capped in reality. 64% of the public are on the over here. So slight lean that way. I guess we'll go that way too. Again, it's a middling number. Let's go over the 45 and a half. Eagles straight up. We're going to hammer the Eagles minus four and a half against the spread in a game that goes over 45 and a half points. That is your silver pick. My gold pick, where I'm also a red hot five and one straight up, three and three against the spread, and four and two on the over under. So I would say this is my best of these four picks so far this season. Sees the Atlanta Falcons at home playing host to the New York Giants. Now, Giants come into this game off of the long week because obviously they played Philly in the Thursday nighter. But, uh, you know, there's this thing called playing and there's this thing called succeeding. The Giants certainly did one. They did not do the other. This is a Giants football team that is an absolute tire fire right now. Now they're talking about trading Odell Beckham. I suppose I shouldn't say now. I mean, those conversations have been happening for a while. But Eli Manning looks like he's completely out of gas. And if you can't throw the football or can't throw the football well, how in the world can you expect to win in the NFL? And that's not just from a statistical standpoint, that's from a mechanical standpoint. Like, he just looks like he can't throw the football anymore. And again, I've talked about it a few times. The Giants don't have anyone behind him. There's the, the solution to the quarterback problem is not in that room. But I do know a guy. Falcons won last week. Certainly not a super convincing win. It was only a five-point win, but it was against a Tampa Bay team that's been scoring a lot of points this season. Atlanta, obviously the defense is the real downfall of the Falcons so far this season. Look, they got the worst defense statistically by their scoring defense anyway, by a mile in that division. They've given up 192 points in six games, but they're in a decent spot here where they're at home against a team that does not travel overly well. Worth pointing out that their one win this season was on the road, but it was against an AFC team. Actually, they have not beaten an NFC team yet this season. I like the Falcons here. I think the Falcons are going to be able to put up a bunch of points. Hopefully they might get, you know, they might get Mo Sanu back and they might get uh, somebody, uh, Shelby, I believe. They might get him back on the defensive side to kind of help anchor the D-line, chase down Eli Manning, which no one has had any problems doing so far this season. I just like the Falcons here. I just, even though it's a long week for the Giants and they should be relatively well rested, I just don't see them coming out and winning this game. We're going to take the Falcons at home to beat the Giants. On the line, Atlanta's favored by six points at home. That's a lot of points. I was considering a hedge. Only 68% of the public are on Atlanta minus six. But I think there's going to be a lot of points in the game. It's under a touchdown. So I think we're going to go ahead and take that. Let's hammer the Falcons and take Atlanta minus the six points total in the game is 54 and a half this is right around where i have it capped maybe a little bit higher but kind of the same as when we were talking about the chargers atlanta is also five and one over under this season so if i like the falcons to win and i like them to cover i might as well like a bunch of points in that game so let's go over 54 and a half Falcons straight up, we're going to hammer the Falcons minus six against the spread in a game that goes over 54 and a half points. That is your gold pick. And the platinum pick where I'm four and two straight up, only two and four against the spread, but three and three on the over-under, sees the Kansas City Chiefs playing host to the Cincinnati Bengals. And this pick is nothing at all against the Cincinnati Bengals. Not in the least. It is a display of my utter... Uh, astonishment and amazement at how good the Chiefs on offense have been this season. There's going to be a lot of points in this football game. Cincinnati can certainly score their points and they're going to in this football game. I, I just, I look at what like Patrick Mahomes as a rookie essentially was able to do to go in to Foxborough and almost beat the Patriots. Like that was very close. That could very easily have happened. 
and that just it just impressed me so much and now they get to come home where they are incredibly good in their own building it's a difficult place to play in we're going to take the chiefs here at home to beat the Bengals. On the line, Chiefs are also favored by six points, the exact same way that the Falcons were, and it's the same deal. I heavily considered a hedge here. Only 65% of the public are on the Chiefs, but once again, it's under a touchdown. I expect a ton of points in this game. We're going to take the Chiefs minus the six points. Total in the game is 58 and a half points, and I believe that is the highest. Oh, yeah, that's the highest total by far so far this season. And I've even got it or so far this season, this week, but I've even got it capped higher than this. I've got it capped as a mid 60. So I think with confidence, you can take over the 58 and a half points. Chiefs straight up. We're going to hammer the Chiefs against the spread at minus six in a game that goes over 58 and a half points. That is your platinum pick. Okay, folks, those are all of your week seven picks in NFL action. It is time now for the patented comment of the week. And the comment of the week from the week six video goes to another fellow NFL YouTube prognosticator, Andrew Warren. He's going to get the comment of the week from the week six video. There were a number of really good comments on the video this week, so you certainly didn't make my job easy. Andrew Warren's comment from week six reads, Hey, congrats on getting a thousand subscribers, Justin. Andrew, thank you very much. You make great videos and episodes. I don't care how long your video is. You get me through my long work days like today. Good luck, Justin. So that is the comment of the week from the week six episode. And I'm glad that at least to Andrew and to a couple of other people, it doesn't matter how long the episode is because this is going to be a longer episode. <laughs> All right, folks, that is going to do it for the week seven episode. It is in the books. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you enjoy the week seven football games. Like I said, this was a tough week to cap. I, you know, man, I don't, I don't see a repeat of last week happening. I'm just going to say that. I think we'll be all right, but this is a tough week of football games and there are a bunch of trap scenarios and upset scenarios that could very easily happen this week. That's it for me, Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, fueled as always by the great folks at NerdTees, nerdtees.ca, hit that promo code BWFinest, save yourself 15% at checkout, enjoy the games in week 7, we'll see you again for week 8. Mm -hmm.